Welcome to Libertarian Counterpoint. My name is John Cameron. I'll be the moderator of the show this evening. The show can be seen at uh, 8 o'clock on Thursday um, on uh, Local Access Sacramento Network, I think, Channel 17. It is also uh, available on YouTube. And on the show tonight, we're going to do things slightly differently this evening. I'm going to uh, introduce myself, and uh, which I think I already did. I work um, for Pacific Legal Foundation. Um, as a development officer, I raise money so that my organization can uh, defend the Constitution of the United States. And I'm going to turn the introduction over to Brett next. Brett Owens, uh, co-founder of a software company called Lead Dino. We make marketing software that helps small businesses market uh, their websites. And I'm also uh, editor-in-chief of Contrarian Outlook, where we focus on uh, dividend-paying investments. Cool. And Gerald? My name is Gerald Clift. I'm an attorney and computer programmer. Okay. And then um, just, I think it's really interesting when you get three libertarians together. We never have more than one libertarian speak because they'll disagree with each other. And it's interesting how we, we, we came to libertarianism. I came to it through uh, our reading Ayn Rand at age 16. Um, and then, um, you know, really realized that uh, when I was in the military, I signed an oath that said I, I swore to protect and defend the Constitution of the United States against uh, all enemies, foreign and domestic. And after a while, I realized that uh, there was a lot of enemies domestic in black robes as judges, uh, unelected bureaucrats that had all three powers invested in government and had never been given to them, and um, some elected officials that, uh, instead of protecting and defending the Constitution, chose to uh, amend and ignore it. And that's why I'm uh, doing what I do for a living, and that's why I'm an advocate for, for uh, liberty whenever I can get there. Brett, what, how did you arrive at? Uh... So for me, it started a little later in my early 20s when I got a real job mm. and realized that I did not have much personal freedom uh, mm. at that uh, time. So I started looking for uh, personal freedom in the form of basically financial freedom. Mm my way to Harry Brown, the old uh, uh, finding freedom in an unfree world. So that appealed to me because you had a lot of control over uh, yourself, maybe not less so the farther out you go, mm -hmm. uh, but looking for ways to achieve the personal freedoms mm -hmm. and then start reading the, uh, uh, the other societal type uh, libertarian readings as well, the Ayn Rands and such. Okay. All right. And Gerald, how did you um, arrive where you are today? Uh, staunch libertarian? Well, for me, I uh, have been passionate about the Patriot Act, uh, my opposition to it, mm. and... Uh, Not a staunch defender <laughs> of the total destruction of the Constitution, are you then? No, yeah. no, I was uh, mm. very disillusioned that that passed, and um, I felt very strongly about some other issues the libertarians hold dear, like uh, ending the drug war, mm. and then, uh, you know, Ron Paul came along during the presidential debates, and I mean, he just spoke to me, and just all these issues just mm. seemed to be right on the nail and I uh, followed him more uh, went out to Iowa to help him out in his first presidential run and um, learned more and more about libertarianism and staunch defender of it cool all right and uh, since probably only libertarians are watching the show we can't convert anybody but hopefully we'll give you some good talking points and and reinforce your understanding that uh, this path is the right one so the first thing we're going to talk about tonight is a, a case that Pacific Legal Foundation uh, defended a guy named John Duarte um, in uh, Duarte Nursery versus Corps of Engineers. It started in uh, 2012 when John plowed a field, which is uh, there's something called uh, Waters of the United States, um, and and the laws that support Waters of the United States specifically spell out uh, the fact that plowing is exempt from any laws. Um, and he got in a little. Uh, I don't know, what, what, how can I say this politely? A disagreement with local uh, Corps of Engineers officials who said that uh, somehow he managed to destroy waters of the United States, meaning vernal pools or puddles that for about three, three weeks out of the year are six inches deep. So after, um, I don't know, four years off and on in court and, and violation of his uh, First Amendment rights and rights to due process, uh, facing fines of $2.3 million and mitigation costs that could be $48 million, um, John Duarte agreed to settle for $1.1 million. 
for plowing a field. And I'd like everybody um, uh, who's watching the show to uh, go to Pacific Legal Foundation's website and, and, uh, and look at the facts of the case. And then um, Google before and after pictures of the pasture that was supposedly where all these horrible acts happened. The pasture, it's pasture now, uh, was going to be a wheat field. Um, looks exactly the same now as it did four years ago, and who knows how much the guy's spent on uh, legal fees. And he settled, you know, basically because he was at risk of losing his business, putting 500 people out of work and more. So um, i just like to open it up, kind of the administrative state thing where these um, independent regulatory agencies have the executive, judicial, and um, legislative powers all on their own. They're given a mandate by can Congress to um, really follow a certain mission, and they're given pretty strict guidelines on it, and then they write their own regulations and enforce their own actions and they judge whether or not those actions are right or wrong. And, and I'd like to open that up and ask, is this right? No, I, I, don't, I think it's uh, very sad. I mean, as you pointed out, I mean, he's facing 40, over $40 million possibly mm. in cost. So it's not even really a choice, you know, mm. betting that you can spend $1 million or risk spending $40 million and risk mm. the lives of all your workers, your family. Uh, I, I, this is a general problem that Mike Lee, a uh, senator from Utah, likes to talk mm. about a lot, that the federal government, and really uh, localities as, as well, but they've uh, grown so large that these bureaucracies write all these regulations and Congress has no say in what effectively becomes law affecting all of us. Mm. So we're not really so much represented by the people that we elect to represent us, but more so the people that are just hired throughout the bureaucratic institutions, and I, I think it's wrong. Yeah, we saw this. Uh, I saw this firsthand with a friend who. So, if you own a, a business, you usually pay estimated taxes, where you, you write a check to the federal government, you write a check to the state government, you do it on a quarterly basis. They now have options to let you pay electronically, and I never pay electronically because I don't trust them. Uh, my friend owns a. Hold on, you don't trust our government. I know. It, I know it's surprising. I'm, I'm I know. I know it's that. surprising. So I would rather send the check, let them cash it, and that is that. Mm -hmm. They don't have access to the account. I have a friend who have a, has a consulting practice, and he was paying electronically, and then they deemed that uh, he owed them employment taxes. He has no employees. They took some odd thousand, five, six thousand dollars just out of his account, and then they sorted it out with him. So they just took his money, and then they asked questions is later. That, is that legal? Doesn't sound legal, but they now had his money, and he was guilty uh, until proven innocent. So that's uh, almost like asset forfeiture by electronic means. Yeah. Yeah, this, uh, this comes up a lot. Um, a few years ago, I, I want to say the Washington Post had an article about how there was more uh, civil asset forfeiture than actual theft. Mm. Um, and then uh, in the cases you're talking about, you know, these small. Businesses can be ruined too. There was a uh, New York Times had a good article about how a few businesses that the where the owners would deposit more than ten thousand dollars into their bank account over and over again got flagged as you know having suspicious activity and actually ended up having in one case over almost hundred thousand uh, dollars seized via civil asset forfeiture and then it's on the owner to go def basically argue that they should never had their property seized, which is totally backwards. Mm. You should have a case first. And then have your, your property seized. I think that the, the, isn't the presumption in the French judicial system that guilt you're you're guilty and then you have to prove your innocence. Here we're innocent until proven guilty, except if cops need a little extra money to go on a vacation. Well, that's so, the worst part of it. They get to spend it too. They get to I, spend it. Scene. They get to spend it. And and uh, the the uh, normal moderator for the show has said repeatedly, and, and uh, I believe him because he usually has his facts straight, that uh, asset forfeiture, civil asset forfeiture, um, takes more money from people than burglary in this country. So that's a little scary thought. Well, I think we might have, we might have uh, since we're all in agreement, and probably 99% of our viewers, that uh, giving power to bureaucrats to, uh, to have all three powers of government rolled up into one, which... Congress doesn't have the power, the president doesn't have the power, even the Supreme Court doesn't, but somehow we hand all this power over to a local bureaucracy is probably a very bad thing. 
and patently unconstitutional. So, next thing. Um, the uh, lamestream media selective approach to First Amendment rights, and we're going to talk about a really touchy subject, the Charlottesville rally and all the fallout, and just as a starting point, and then move on to some maybe some less, um, what's the word I'm looking for, less touchy examples of that, perhaps. Maybe we, we can't get anywhere with this and we just go to less touchy. So. Um, Brett, you want to? You want to? Uh, Brett, you want to mm -hmm. chime in on that? Sure. Well, I would imagine we're in agreement that no matter what we think of the group, they have the right in this country to free speech. Mm. Uh, my take on it uh, would be also, though, if if you're if you're looking for a fight, you at least have to pay for your own security. My issue is that, uh, and we saw this at the Capitol here mm. uh, within the last year, where a similar uh, type party marched they got and they get all geared up like they're looking for a fight they got there was violence okay. that broke out with the yeah. counter protesters but that takes a lot of uh, police force to provide security for both parties and uh, my view on it is that if you're if you're going to do that I, I like the old libertarian saying you can do whatever you want as long as you don't bother anyone else in this case you're kind of bothering other people in terms of you're using public resources and you're hogging them and you're taking police that maybe should be somewhere else and now uh, they're posted up in, t in front of this protest making sure nobody else gets hurt. Mm -hmm. I, I think that burden, the financial burden of the security has to be, uh, it's fine in, in my opinion if you want to march but you got to pay for the protection so, yourself. I want to ask a clarifying mm -hmm. question. I, I like your idea except for I think the, the idea of private security. I would think that uh, if you buy the security, whoever's writing the check would get the most uh, protection. So maybe we, we ask the people who are marching uh, to pay for the police services so that, uh, you know, that the, their actual salaries can be spent somewhere else. That would just be an idea. I mean, I like the idea that, you know, if you're going to do something that's probably going to lead to a, a kerfuffle, a little you know, some fisticuffs that, uh, you know, you, you should pay for it. And, and again, it's, it's fuzzy, but what do you think? Well, I, I, uh, I definitely think the, uh, certainly the white supremacists that were there were looking for a fight. I mean, like, uh, you mm. know, Trump wanted to call out the, the left for bringing um, weapons, but plenty of uh, why wouldn't accounts, this according to LA Times, found white supremacists carrying rods and other weapons when mm. they um, went in there. And, and when it comes to the cops, you know, private security is probably something they should have paid for. But what, what's interesting is multiple eyewitness accounts confirmed that the cops basically just sat there mm. and let these people just tear each other apart. Duke it out. Yeah, mm. whereas um, you think that would be a situation in which, you know, they're there, they would try to intervene and pre prevent people from causing harm to each other, at the very least start arresting the people mm. who appear to be the, the actual aggregate, aggravators uh, causing all the violence. Mm. But... Um, no, it's a, it's a, go ahead. no. Go ahead. Go ahead. I would say it's, it's a touchy topic. It's um, I, I, everyone has the right to free speech, no matter how abhorrent it is. There was a good New York Times article a couple of days ago about. Um, Wait, hold on. Stop the presses. There was a good New York Times article. <laughs> I, I actually, mm -hmm. though, though they lean left in terms of their uh, overall bias, yeah. I, I, I would say they're pretty good at fact checking. Mm -hmm. I mean, you get the. A lot of the, the Except for that, they, they, they had to backstep. Um, they ran a headline that said that um, these people needed to release some information about, uh, I think, climate change or something because they were worried about, uh, worried about Trump suppressing this, this information about the truth about climate change. But then they found out that that so-called suppressed information had been available online for eight months. And... Uh, so they had a little egg, egg on their face. But if you look at Google, if you just on my homepage when I put up Google, Google News, that article, which has been retracted, is still the top article that comes up on my page. So that's my, my take is that the, the um, uh, lamestream media, in this case now it's Google, which used to be pretty objective, uh, really is very selective in, in, in their choice. Well, you know, I, I was going to talk about the article was actually about um, the ACLU and the struggle that they've had because uh, they lost a lot of membership when they defended Nazis a few decades ago. Mm -hmm. And even in Charlottesville, they were the ones to say, no, these white um, supremacists get to protest at the site of the statue rather than what the city wanted 
for them to be at a much larger park several blocks away. Mm -hmm. But um, generally speaking, I, I don't really lump the New York Times or e even the Washington Post, although they were bought recently by Jeff Bezos and LA Times and these other uh, news periodicals within what I, I would call the uh, mainstream media. 90% uh, of the news we see is owned by about six companies mm -hmm. and actually all the media in general. And those those conglomerates really control most of what we see. The, the newspapers tend to be, again, Washington Post bought out recently, but uh, owned by the same families for more than 100 years. And mm. they're, they're, these, they're the papers that provide us the, you know, uh, whether it be the Pentagon Papers or the Edward mm. Snowden docs. And I, I do think they do a pretty good job at that reporting. And uh, both New York Times and LA Times have, at least I've seen the last couple of days in both um, editorial boards and just general articles talked about the need for debate on both sides, even when it's abhorrent that we can't just drown mm. them out entirely. Well, I I'm, I'm, uh, haven't been paying attention to it, but I'm, I'm very pleased that um, the newspapers and the ACLU, which has been very disappointing to me in many respects over the last few years, would defend uh, free speech rights. Maybe the, the uh, Republic isn't, isn't lost. Uh, after all, whereas, hey, go ahead. I was going to say, whereas you know, MSNBC uh, Pew study found that they were the most biased um, news organization in the entire country, second only to Fox News uh, during the 2012 presidential you mean election. Even more than the Clinton News Network, CNN. Even, even more? more than them. They might have been. Wow. Third. <laughs> wow. I, I find that, uh, and Pew has changed radically. Uh, well, well one angle to watch on the technology front, you're bringing up Google, and I heard on uh, Bloomberg Radio today that Airbnb, which uh, is kind of the hotels.com for wanting to stay somewhere, that they had proactively uh, started deleting reservations in uh, Charlottesville for white supremacists who booked reservations there. If you're going for the protest, they proactively deleted your reservation. How did they, how did they know you were... No, they looked at your social. They looked at their social media profiles, uh -huh. mm. connected that, deleted it. It's something that very few people will argue with, but a pretty dangerous precedent. Well, I would, think. I would argue the heck out of it. That would mean that uh, is it okay to delete uh, to to delete their booking or cancel their booking, but if the um, Libertarian Party wanted to go somewhere, would it be? I mean, who draws that line? And I think. Um, we're constitutionally protected from things like that, you know. I mean, if if uh, if Airbnb decided to look on social media and determine that you were black or a Democrat and delete your booking in an area, people would be up in arms over it. I hope people are up in arms over that. It, it's, yeah. it's a dangerous precedent, especially with so few tech companies controlling so much of the Internet. Mm -hmm. It only takes a few uh, decisions that they make, and they mm -hmm. can... And do whatever yeah, they, they can, want. They can tour. You're both, you guys are both pretty techie. You're, you're actually a programmer, mm -hmm. aren't you? So, um, you know, you can, you can be pretty selective in your application of an algorithm um, and really kind of force slant the news. I mean, just as an experiment during the election, I typed in uh, Hillary Clinton LI like, and, and I stopped. And on Google, I got library, I got uh, everything but lie, but if I typed it in on a couple other websites, I got lie, you know, which is what everybody's looking for when they type in Hillary Clinton and lie, right? So um, that uh, kind of selective application is uh, a dangerous thing. I think um, as libertarians, we'd all agree that what we want is uh, objective news actually p reporting what, it, what is the who, what, when, where, why, and how. Isn't that what they teach you in basic uh, journalism? That's what okay. they used to teach. Hmm? That's what they used to teach. Yeah, what they used to teach. <laughs> now okay. it's about clicks. <laughs> yep. Clicks, yes, yes. So uh, now there's, um, we have, I think, about 10 minutes left in this show. Where does the time go when I'm talking too much? Um, and I was going to talk about, um, um, I think it will go with um, the, uh, the concept of, uh, immunity of government employees from prosecution of crimes due to sovereignty, which I think was not originally in constitutional documents and was added later. But I, again, you're trained in, in law. I don't know what your background in constitutional law is. Gerald, what do you... I, I think it's, it's a big problem, this idea that just because you work for the government, somehow you have special privileges. Mm. You know, we saw Sounds it. like divine right of kings, doesn't it? It, it does, yeah. it does. Yeah. And, I, mean, I believe it is from... British law or was inspired by British law. 
I mean, we talked about um, so last for sure a little bit earlier. We talked mm -hmm. about um, the ability of these. Uh, entities to create regulations, basically interpreting law and essentially mm. creating law. Mm. But uh, more importantly, I mean, we, a few months ago, was an article about how the cops in Hawaii were trying to lobby to be able to get um, oral sex performed on them by potential prostitutes in order to uh, make sure that they're guilty. And um, so, that's, a, isn't that entrapment? I mean, I, I would call it entrapment. Yeah. 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 Um, and they probably wouldn't even pay for the service. No, that's the that's the worst part, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and there was an article a couple of days ago about a Washington Post article about how um, for the last decade about 1,800 uh, police officers have been fired for misconduct, but a good about 450 of them they had to rehire because of the special rights of the officers through their union contracts. And in uh, many of these cases, they didn't even dispute the underlying misconduct. You know, they just they agreed, yeah, he did that. But then they would say, but you violated his union contract here on these procedures. Mm -hmm. And that, that's very dangerous. They, um, it's gotten to a point where the government almost organizes against the governed and mm -hmm. has more power and influence with representatives than the people do. Mm -hmm. uh, case in point, the uh, public sector unions, they're able to just ask for more and more and more and they have a monopoly over this. You know, it's not like a corporation where you have a private mm -hmm. sector union. Maybe the union will ask for too much and it's going to hurt the company. They'll have to raise their prices, might go mm -hmm. bankrupt or have to do layoffs. Right, there's no feedback mechanism. Exactly. Where the public sector union, they can ask for more forever. Because of monopoly, they'll always get it. Okay. So um, what what could be changed? I mean, could we? Is it? would you think it would be possible? I mean, there's a... There's a Gentleman I know actually wanted to um, get something on the ballot in the state of California. He, it, he couldn't raise the, th I think, $3 million it would take to get the campaign started to do just the thing. I think it was called the Government Accountability Act, where basically, you know, if uh, government employees uh, violated people's rights, um, that would hold them up to prosecution if they were in the private sector then the same rules would apply if they're in the public sector. That would apply uh, to the state employees then, state, state of California? Yeah, state employees, yeah. any, any employee anywhere. I mean, everybody, I think, um, something like all men are created equal. I read that somewhere. I don't, uh, it's in some little piece of paper somewhere. So um, I think we're all in agreement on that. And it's a, it's a, it's a tough thing. And I think um, my my feeling is that that trend of special protections and special rights for certain favored groups, like uh, somebody tried to float a, a an idea a while back. I hope it was squashed immediately that uh, teachers shouldn't pay any state uh, income tax. Oh yeah, I saw and, that. And I'm um, thinking um, I could I could use that kind of gig. I mean, I'm getting old. Maybe, maybe if I didn't pay any federal tax, I could you know save some more money toward retirement. Sure, what do you think of that idea? Yeah. That a teacher, that a, a selected group should have special tax status? Well, we're voting for software guys <laughs> yeah. to not pay taxes. Oh, you're both software guys. That's right. I'm voting for <laughs> anyone who knows a software guy. To That's right. Taxes. There you go. How about that? There All you right. go. All right. But to your point, I don't see any way, uh, maybe at the state level, if you got it on the ballot and you had a, a direct vote, mm -hmm. I don't see how you would get it repealed at the federal level. Because mm -hmm. state by state? Borough by borough, yeah, whatever. But and would then, it still apply to federal? I mean, how would it apply to federal employees then? You could sue them in a in a certain state. No, you could, yeah, you could sue them in federal court. I mean, it's 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 going to be a reach, but I think there's a backlash in this country. Um, there's something called uh, Chevron deference and our deference, and I'm not a lawyer, so I'm not going to ex explain it. Try to explain it. Um, get one of the excellent lawyers on from a place I work to give it a thorough explanation, but. The, the, the government defers to, to the government, government entities, to, to decide what's right and wrong when there's a, a regulation in question. So that's like... Uh, it's like Congress always voting themselves raises yeah, every year. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, they, and they don't pay for anything anyway, so they have a wonderful right. thing. And I don't know if we, we have time to cover this, but I, I think I'll throw it out there. This is a hot-button topic for me. I like hawks and eagles. And uh, something like 340,000 birds are killed every year in the United States of America by wind turbines. And um, I think this is a selective application of the Endangered Species Act because if one bald eagle was killed during the construction of a nuclear power plant, they'd shut it down. So 
What do you think of that? Selective application of uh, endangered species laws. Yeah, that's a tough one because I, I like the, I like the environmental laws um, as a whole. Get out. No. I'm yeah. Sorry. No. It's the application that's the hard part. I, I think if, if there's things I don't mind government doing, they, they would be at the top of the list where mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't mind the laws. But then you run into situations like this where they, they choose how they're going to enforce mm -hmm. it. And, or they're uh, trying to work to plow in the field. Cause they, sure. You know, yeah. All right. So um, we're getting ready to wrap up the show. Uh, any, any closing comments about any of the subjects that we've talked about this evening? Any thoughts that maybe might have popped up uh, after the talk? No? Well, I think back to our uh, media talk, I wish, uh, uh, I know it's in the past now, but I kind of wish Gary Johnson would have gotten a little more favorable yeah. coverage, I think. Okay. I think he had a few slip-ups in the campaign, and they just jumped on it, and, and that was that when he talked about you know, Hillary kind of getting the benefit of the doubt. Uh, I don't feel like Gary Kinda. got much Kinda. of the benefit Sorta. of the doubt. Sort of, yeah. Huh? Yeah, no, it was, it was unfortunate. I definitely voted for him, and I think we're doing a lot better than our current president. <laughs> well, I, th I think uh, a drunken monkey would be doing. No, I, I have a lot of friends who are big Trump supporters, and I, do, you know, I think we're in the the unfortunate circumstance in this country where we are um, this so-called two-party state is actually a one-party state because they're both pro big government and. Uh, we're pro as little government as you can possibly have because, you know, left to their own devices, people have to uh, have to hold themselves accountable for their actions. And uh, generally, human beings are pretty kind to each other, as uh, seen by the billions and billions of dollars that uh, folks um, give to charity every year. So anything, any closing thoughts? Well, you know, uh, picking up on the, the party system, I don't know if you saw the uh, Reason interview um, a few weeks ago. Uh, Justin Amash was talking about, he's interesting, he's a libertarian leaning but Republican, mm -hmm. and he was talking about how he wants the two-party system to, to end, it's, that it's creating these ridiculous divisions that aren't really over policy but over um, personalities. Mm -hmm. And it's not it's not helping the country. We No one really fits into the Republican or Democratic box. Mm -hmm. And... I don't think that that system really helps anyone except to just keep uh, bad legislation f f passing and prevent good legislation from getting through. Mm -hmm. I think I'd, I think I'd probably agree with that. I'm uh, a parliamentarian system. You know, if in the U.S., I think government gets shut down every two weeks, which might not be a bad thing. I was you know? going to say that's my. And only on hope. that note, <laughs> I think uh, I think it's time to wrap up. My name is John Cameron. I'm your moderator this evening for. Um, Libertarian Counterpoint, I want to thank Brett and Gerald for, for uh, their wonderful contribution to the show and ask you to watch us on the next show.